Tonight at 10, the Chancellor unveils his first budget with big changes to childcare, pensions and benefits to try to get more people back into work. Jeremy Hunt insists his budget will deliver growth, but Labour accuses the government of sticking plaster politics. Today, we build for the future. With inflation down, debt falling and growth up, the declinists are wrong and the optimists are right. A country set on a path of managed decline, falling behind our competitors, the sick man of Europe once again. Free childcare for more people in England, one of the big incentives unveiled today to get more parents back into work. How are we going to afford to be able to put her in nursery for some days a week so I can go back to work? So it, it's quite difficult really, um, but announcing this sounds really promising. Big changes to pensions too, to encourage people to stay in employment. But the Chancellor's plans prompt accusations that his budget favours the rich. Also on the programme tonight. Markets fall in Europe and the US amid concerns about the troubled banking giant Credit Suisse. And stay with us here on BBC News for continuing coverage and analysis from our team of correspondents in the UK and around the world. Good evening. The Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, has pledged to build for the future in his first budget, promising it will deliver growth. He told MPs that the economic forecast has improved, the economy will shrink slightly but avoid going into recession this year, with inflation predicted to fall to just under 3% by the end of the year. The big focus was on getting more people into work, with changes to childcare, benefits and pensions. In England, free childcare will be expanded to all children over the age of nine months, with up to 30 hours a week for eligible households. There'll be money for schools to provide wraparound childcare outside the school day. That's from September. On benefits, there are plans to apply universal credit sanctions for those refusing to work more rigorously. On pensions, there are changes to tax rules to enable high earners to save more into their pensions tax-free. It's hoped it will encourage people, particularly senior doctors, to return to work. But the government's independent forecasters, the OBR, say we still face the sharpest fall in living standards since the 1950s. And Labour has accused the government of sticking plaster politics. Our first report tonight is from our political editor, Chris Mason. When will things actually get better, Chancellor? There have been rather a few Chancellors of late. Here is the current one, Jeremy Hunt, the fourth in a year and a big personal moment. At one end of Downing Street, his wife and children. At the other end, out on Whitehall and beyond, this again. Striking workers, schools closed, demonstrations. To end the, strikes, Chancellor. the answers, or lack of them, would come down the road in Parliament. The overall message, things are tough, but improving. I report today on a British economy which is proving the doubters wrong. Yeah. The UK will not now enter a technical recession this year. Yeah. Soaring energy bills have been a massive factor in crippling family finances in the last year. The government's help to ease the burden is to be extended until the summer. This measure will save the average family a further £160 on top of the energy support measures already announced. Here's another choice the Chancellor's made, maintaining the 5p a litre cut in fuel duty and not putting it up in line with rising prices. That saves the average driver £100 next year and around £200 since the 5p cut was introduced. Yeah! The headline rate of corporation tax is going up, not popular among all his MPs. Businesses will pay less, though, if they put money into their future growth. That means that every single pound a company invests in IT equipment, plant or machinery can be deducted in full and immediately from taxable profits. Yeah. 
A big part of this budget is getting more people into work. There are measures to help those with disabilities and 50 and 60-somethings tempted to retire. Now they'll be able to save more in a pension tax-free every year. And the Chancellor will... Abolish the lifetime allowance. It is a pension tax reform that will stop over 80% of NHS doctors from receiving a tax charge. Incentivise our most experienced and productive workers to stay in work for longer. Critics say it will help the already very well off. Childcare has become a big political battleground between Labour and the Conservatives. Mr Hunt said this about his plans for England. We will introduce 30 hours of free childcare, not just for three and four-year-olds, but for every single child over the age of nine months. Yeah! It's a package worth, on average, £6,500 every year and reduces their childcare costs by nearly 60%. Yeah! But it won't be fully up and running for two and a half years. In the round, ministers want this to be seen as a steady-as-you-go budget. The declinists are wrong and the optimists are right. We, we stick to the plan because the plan is working and I commend this statement to the House. In response, the opposition parties were scathing. Managed decline, Britain going backwards, the sick man of Europe once again. That's the Britain they've created and they should look it in the eye. A UK whose performance deteriorated after the Brexit referendum, both in absolute and relative terms. And a country, the only one in the G7, where the economy has not returned to its pre-pandemic level. We know that a lot of households are struggling with the prices at the moment, so we really wanted to see him extend also some of the support payments that have previously been issued to households and businesses. Um, he hasn't done that. It's a real missed opportunity, in our opinion. What do you say to people who say this is a budget for the rich, allowing people who are already well off, already earn a lot, save more into their pensions? Well, of course we want to uh, help older people uh, who want to stay in work and by definition, they will generally be on higher salaries. But nearly five times more help is going to young parents. Your official forecasters say that the freezing of the income tax thresholds over six years is the equivalent to putting 4p on income tax. You're, you're clobbering people. I thought Conservatives were meant to cut taxes. Conservatives cut taxes when they can. Uh, today, I cut corporation tax by £9 billion. But remember this, And raise the headline right. Uh, yes, but the pandemic, we spent £400 billion to support businesses and families. How much of today is still about shoveling up the mess of your Conservative predecessors? It's not. Today is about... None a, of it? No. The financial statistics about the country, they've completely recovered from that. Today is about a long-term growth plan. Hello, boys and girls. The blunt political truth Hello. is Conservative opinion poll ratings have not recovered. He, they, have a lot of persuading to do. Chris Mason, BBC News, at Westminster. Well, the independent watchdog, the Office for Budget Responsibility, predicts the UK economy will shrink this year, but will avoid a technical recession. That's when it shrinks for two quarters in a row. It warned of a big drop in living standards over the next two years, the sharpest since records began in the 1950s. And house prices are predicted to fall by 10%. Our economics editor, Faisal Islam, has been looking at the numbers behind today's budget and is here now. Faisal. Yes, Sophie, the Chancellor called it a comprehensive plan for growth, but that is against the backdrop of a flat economy, of widespread strikes even today of declining living standards. This is what the government's official independent forecast of the OBR thinks is going to happen with the economy year by year versus where they were in November. You can see here it's better this year and next, and that's no longer an official recession, but it is still down this year. But it's a touch worse in future years after the likely election. Broadly speaking, the forecast looks a bit better this year. That's mostly luck. That's the economy doing a bit better. That's um, uh, energy prices going up less than uh, expected. Over the medium term, a little bit of the additional growth is, according to the Office of Budget Responsibility, down to some of the measures that we've seen in particular, expecting to get a few more people into work. Now, what's underlying all this? The Chancellor's central aim is a 
plan for growth that implicitly acknowledges two core ongoing problems, a lack of workers and very low investment. The OBR has given a verdict on, these, uh, on the Chancellor's measures, an early marking of the homework, if you like, and they say, yes, it could boost the workforce by between 55 and 250,000. As a result of those measures, childcare, pension, six and this benefits, compared to a loss of some half a million workers since the pandemic. So that could be material for the economy. But on the other problem, investment, look at this, the pattern for the new corporation tax break. Those new allowances lead to a boom in investment in the next couple of years. But then a quite sharp correction as the policy is assumed to end. And actually, in those future years over here, it's less investment than what was forecast before the policy announcement. So net-net, the official forecast is no overall improvement in investment from this three-year policy. However, there were dozens of other policies to try to jumpstart high-tech growth in key sectors from medicine to artificial intelligence up and down the country. But even if that does work perfectly in boosting growth, it will take some time to escape the shadow of the current hit to spending power. This shows post-inflation disposable income for households, the squeeze on your wages and wallets. It was already predicted to fall sharply for two years on the trot in the red over there. And while that fall is now a little smaller, thanks to lower energy prices, the official forecaster says this remains an historic fall in living standards over the decades. Back in November, we thought that living standards were going to be fall by about 7%. That's because inflation was outstripping growth in earnings over this financial year and next. Because we're now seeing lower inflation and also slightly higher wage deals, we think that the fall in living standards is going to be only 6%. But that's still a historic two-year fall in living standards in the UK and not something we've seen since we started collecting records on these things back in the 1950s. The self-titled back-to-work budget came on a day of strikes in schools and the wider public sector. For now, no extra money there, but a hope that settlements are on the way. No money for those tax cuts just yet either. The Chancellor's microsurgery on the economy could change the game for Britain's sluggish growth and its deep-seated causes at a time when other economies have grand plans for green growth. He and his Downing Street neighbour will need to deliver results very quickly. Sophie. Faisal, thank you. Well, the UK has one of the most expensive childcare systems in the world. Free childcare in England is now being expanded to encourage more parents to return to work. This is what has been announced today. If both parents are in work and earning at least £152 per week, they will be eligible for 30 free hours of childcare per week from the age of nine months. That's for England, with equivalent funding given to the other nations. The scheme will be phased in from next April, with eligible two-year-olds getting 15 hours, and all measures are expected to be in place by September 2025. Each carer in England will also be able to look after five two-year-olds instead of four, as is already the case in Scotland. The 700,000 families on universal credit will get childcare support paid up front instead of claiming it back and they'll also be able to claim for more help if they are moving into work or increasing their hours. The government also said they'd work with local councils to ensure all schools in England will offer wraparound care between 8am and 6pm by September 2026. Our political correspondent Alex Forsyth has been meeting parents in the West Midlands to see what they think of today's announcement. Few parents would have been jumping for joy over the cost of childcare of late. So at this baby sensory group in West Bromwich, today's announcement was broadly welcomed. Say hello Many here who want to work know the struggle of juggling that with childcare costs. I worked out that to go back three days, I couldn't actually afford the childcare for three days. So I have to go back four to be able to put her in nursery for four. But then I, that mum guilt of, but I'm leaving her. So hopefully it'll actually help. But Sarah, a teacher keen to return to her job, is frustrated that she'll have to wait until next September before she sees any benefit. In that year, um, how, how are we going to afford to be able to put her in nursery for some days a week so I can go back to work? So it, it's quite difficult, really. Um, but announcing this sounds really promising. What does Kieran do then? In nearby Walsall, this nursery is working out what the change will mean for them. This is already a sector under strain, facing rising costs and staff shortages. Director Debbie is concerned that even though the government is increasing the funding for free childcare hours by 30%, they'll be left short. I think it will make close more nurseries than it will save because they won't be able to afford to keep running. 
even with that extra money that the Chancellor's... It's not been. enough. 30% will not cover the costs. She's already decided that here they won't reduce the number of staff for younger children, one option announced today to try to ease pressures. They're very vulnerable at two and it's going to affect the workforce as well. It's extra pressure having that one extra child per adult. Not far away, this town was named by the Chancellor as one of those in line for regeneration. Help with childcare costs was one element of a budget meant to boost the stagnant economy. The wider West Midlands was given special status to attract investment. But at this martial arts club in West Bromwich, some challenges feel more immediate. Here, the extended help with energy bills is welcome, as is the promise of falling inflation. But the reality now is still tough. We've ended up paying five seventy five and gone up to one thousand one hundred pound a month in rent. Your rent, so your rent's doubled. Yeah. How's that affecting you? Hard work at the minute because I say we can't afford to eat. I feel like sometimes like a lot of the food at college is like also quite expensive, so I'm struggling a lot as well for money wise in that situation because a lot of it's just gone up in price. The club leaders, though, are hopeful for the future. We try and create an environment where people see opportunity, even when you're in an area such as West Bromwich and the West Midlands, which doesn't have a lot of prosperity compared to other areas. Some economic optimism might have been the tone the Chancellor was trying to strike. The question, though, is whether his budget leaves people feeling better off. Alex Forsyth, BBC News, West Bromwich. Well, there were significant changes announced to a range of benefits, too, to encourage people back into work. Our social affairs correspondent, Michael Buchanan, is with me. Now you've been looking through it. What, what, has, been off, what has been announced? Well, in broad terms, the benefit system makes a distinction between being ill and being disabled. And to get additional payments, claimants have to go through two separate tests. The government's plan is to scrap the work capability assessment, which is the test they currently use to decide if someone is too ill to work. From 2026, the only people who will get that top-up payment are those who qualify for the main disability benefit. And crucially, they'll be allowed to keep that money even if they get a job. But there will be a group of people who do who are ill but don't qualify for the disability benefit who will not get that top-up payment. The government are also planning to use artificial intelligence to automate benefit sanctions for those who fall foul of the rules, particularly if they turn down a job. It's worth pointing out sanctions are at near record levels at the moment and the literature suggests they don't really work in that way. And finally, a word on those over 50s that everybody's trying to get into. Work have stopped working since the pandemic. The research suggests that just one in 10 of them are relying on benefits to get by. So the welfare system is possibly not the best way of getting them into work. Michael, thank you. The Chancellor also unveiled some specific measures for Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland today. In a moment, we'll hear from Emma Vardy in Belfast and Thomas Morgan in Cardiff. But first to Alexandra McKenzie in Glasgow. Many of today's announcements don't apply here in Scotland. Instead, the Scottish Government will get £320 million as part of the block grant and could choose, for example, to extend free childcare. The freeze in the energy price cap does apply to Scotland. That's been extended till the end of June. And the freeze in fuel duty for another year. In the arts, up to £8.6 million has been given directly to the Edinburgh festivals. This has been welcomed by the Scottish tourism sector. The SNP say this is yet another wasted opportunity by the UK government to help businesses and households through the cost of living crisis. On Jeremy Hunt's first headline announcement on childcare, the Welsh Labour government is already coming under pressure from opposition parties to follow suit. A phased expansion of childcare for two-year-olds is already being rolled out across Wales. And the Cabinet here say they will consider how best to spend the extra money from this year's budget. Now on Jeremy Hunt's second major announcement, the expansion of the energy price cap guarantee, that is important for two reasons here in Wales. Firstly, because generally homes are older here and less energy efficient. And secondly, because wages are lower, which means a higher percentage of household income goes towards fuel payments compared to more affluent parts of the UK. And lastly, it's worth mentioning something that wasn't in the budget. No extra funding towards the public sector. This is something the Welsh Labour government have been calling for for some time, because almost a third of Wales works in the public sector. And the Welsh Labour government's response to this, that this is a budget that prioritises petrol and potholes over investment in the public sector. 
overall, the Treasury says Northern Ireland is getting an extra £130 million of funding over the next couple of years. It's not going to feel like an awful lot here because local finances are under extreme pressure. That free childcare won't apply to Northern Ireland because that's something for the devolved government at Stormont to decide whether to follow. And there's no government sitting here at the moment because of divisions over Brexit. As for the energy price cap, well, customers in Northern Ireland already had a little more generous relief from energy bills earlier on this winter. So in effect, energy prices here will increase slightly. There was one or two other pots of money for specific things in Northern Ireland, one of them being Northern Ireland's tackling paramilitarism program. There's an extra three million pounds for that. It's something pretty unique to this place. It's to help communities deal with the effects of the armed gangs that still operate here. Emma Vardy there. Well, there was a lot in the budget today. The Chancellor was on his feet for an hour. So let's have a look at some of the other measures that he announced. The energy price guarantee will remain until the start of July. Those on prepayment meters will be charged the same as those on direct debit. To help pubs, the tax on a typical pint of draft beer will be frozen from August the 1st and cigarette duty will increase by 15%. For drivers, fuel duty has been frozen for another year. And there's £200 million for pothole repairs in England. Our business editor, Simon Jack, is here on what it all means for business. Simon. Thank you, Sophie. Yes, the Chancellor has badged this as a budget for growth and he needs business to help him deliver on that promise. Now, something many businesses were hoping the government might reverse is the rising corporation tax from 19 to 25 per cent from April the 1st. That will be the rate of tax on profits over £250,000. The government says only 10 per cent of companies will pay that rate, but it goes ahead. But to soften that blow, the Chancellor will allow companies to deduct every pound they invest in new IT, new plants, new machinery from their profits, meaning the more companies invest, the less they pay. But that's replacing a more generous scheme which ends this month. And it's only promised the new scheme for three years. Now, the government also wants some of those who have left their jobs to return to the workforce. We've heard about childcare measures, but there, was me there were measures aimed at older workers too. The cap on the amount workers can put in their pension savings over their lifetime before having to pay extra tax, currently at just over £1, one million, pounds, will be abolished entirely. You keep working, you keep saving, and the amount workers and their employers can put in their pension pot tax-free every year will rise from £40,000 to £60,000. Opposition parties say these are tax cuts for the very highly paid. And to further tackle labour shortage, this wasn't in the speech, but immigration rules will also be relaxed for some roles in the construction sector, including bricklayers, roofers and carpenters. Other sectors struggling to recruit, including retail and hospitality, are disappointed tonight. They were not included. Overall, the budget watchdog thinks these measures will help boost growth in the short term, but the impact will fade if some of those investment incentives aren't permanent. Sophie. Simon, thank you. Another significant focus was on energy as the Chancellor announced plans to ensure a quarter of Britain's energy will come from nuclear power. They are reclassifying nuclear energy as environmentally sustainable to drive more investment in the sector. It's already met with some opposition, as our climate editor Justin Rowlatt reports. The floodlights are on tonight and every night at Europe's largest building site. Work never stops at Hinkley Point in Somerset, where they're building the UK's only new nuclear plant. Nuclear power is big and it is expensive, but it does deliver dependable energy 24-7. And the Chancellor confirmed today the UK's low-carbon future will involve much more of it. Nuclear is essential as part of a future energy mix with wind and solar, renewables as a whole, in order to produce the amount of low carbon energy we need to fight climate change. And if you thought this is what green power looks like, think again. Nuclear power is to be classified as environmentally sustainable, alongside wind and solar, the Chancellor said. Redesignating it as green means it will get the same investment incentives as renewable power, despite the long-term risks from nuclear waste. 
I mean, is it April Fool's Day? I mean, this is utterly ludicrous. How can an energy source be green when, for example, there is a huge amount of nuclear waste? We still don't know what to do with it. It remains radioactive for hundreds and hundreds of years. Nevertheless, we were told we can expect to see new kinds of reactors in future, including smaller scale plants that could look a bit like this. We learned today that a new company, Great British Nuclear, will help drive investment in these and other nuclear technologies. Justin Rowlatt, BBC News. Well, let's get a final thought now from our political editor, Chris Mason, who is in Westminster, the Chancellor's first budget. What's your assessment? What stands out for you? Well, a senior figure in government described it to me as a steady-as-she-goes budget. And I think tonight, as we step back and look at it, you can see why they attach that label to it. If we take a step back and look at the economic picture, it remains bleak. It's just not quite as bleak as some of the forecasts had suggested it might be by this stage. So disposable income remains squeezed. Wages for many remain squeezed. The tax burden remains high. Jeremy Hunt's pitch is to say that he is a serious and careful custodian of the economy, trying to do what he can to lure people back into the workplace, trying to do something on childcare in England, an increasingly competitive political space with uh, Labour also making uh, their own offer there. And then there is the political spike tonight, where the argument looks like it's going to come in the coming days. And this is over uh, this pensions perk for some of the highest paid. Now, the government is trying to lure people back into work or avoid them heading off into retirement and the golf course. Labour, though, think, hang on a minute, this is, in their view, hugely unfair. They're even comparing it with that cut in income tax for the very highest paid that Liz Truss briefly floated and then ditched. Will it prove that totemic? Who knows? Labour will try uh, to make an argument out of it and push it to a vote next week. Our political editor, Chris Mason, in Westminster, thank you. In other financial news, uh, markets have fallen in Europe and the United States amid fears about the Swiss banking giant Credit Suisse. Shares in the bank slumped to a record low as investors remain nervous after the collapse of America's Silicon Valley Bank. Shares in other major financial institutions, including Barclays and HSBC, have also fallen sharply. Well, our business correspondent, Michelle Fleury, is in New York for us now. And Credit Suisse is one of Europe's biggest banks. Just how serious could this be? Yeah, I mean, I think it's safe to say that right now regulators are in a state of high anxiety. Fears are getting very real. We're talking about not just regional banks in America, but a global player, Credit Suisse, Switzerland's second largest lender, which saw its share price plunge to a record low after its top backer ruled out lending it any more money. Now, to try and calm nerves, the Swiss central bank and Swiss banking regulator issued a joint statement saying that they were ready to provide liquidity if needed. And what we've seen is that rising interest rates are beginning to expose cracks in the financial system. We should remind viewers at home that in the UK, if you have deposits of up to £85,000, those are protected by the Financial Services Compensation Fund. So despite all of these worries in the markets about banks, most people are safe. Still, what this does is show that everyone's faith in the financial system has been jolted by the events of the last few days, Sophie. Michelle, thank you. Football now and Liverpool have been knocked out of the Champions League tonight. Having lost the first leg of their tie against Real Madrid 5-2, they were beaten again this evening. Here's Joe Wilson. What chance of success did Jurgen Klopp give his team before kick-off in Madrid? 1%. Well, coming from three goals down is part of Liverpool folklore in Europe. And of course they had to commit to attack. And of course that in turn left them vulnerable at the back. Still in it, their very nature, not often. Joe Wilson, BBC News. Time for the weather now. Thomas Schaffernacker is here. Hello. Mm, hello, Sophie. And a good evening to you. A really gloomy out there with outbreaks of rain. But I just wanted to imply that there will be a little bit of sunshine around too. It's not all bad. But, but I think overall, we'll call it a damp picture uh, for most of us on Thursday. Mild, though. And if you look at the satellite picture, you can see where the clouds are streaming in from the southwest. Quite a broad 
area of cloud wrapping around an area of low pressure and you can see that mild atmosphere spreading all the way from the Azores engulfing much of the UK not the very far north of Scotland in fact earlier on we had some snow across the highlands but uh, eventually that will turn to sleet and then rain and I think after that it's just mild right across the board now the morning temperatures will be around 10 degrees in the south of the country probably about 10 or so in Belfast still cold in Stornoway two degrees and about that in Lerwick. So the morning forecast shows most of the heavy rain I think in Northern Ireland, parts of Scotland, but to the south that rain should be easing. It'll become more showery so it'll wax and wane perhaps through the course of the morning into the afternoon. The possibility of sunny spells, showers and thunderstorms for Northern Ireland tomorrow and a few sunny spells developing in East Anglia in the southeast. Look at those temperatures. 13, 14 degrees. Still low pressure with us on Friday. In fact, a couple of areas of low pressure there with weather fronts sweeping in. I think Friday, rather than sort of an overcast day, we will have frequent sunny spells here and there, but also the possibility of heavier showers developing. And you can see that rash of showers across the country. Here are the temperatures, every bit as mild, if not milder, up to about 16, even across uh, the northeast of England, still chilly in the north of Scotland around eight degrees or so and this outlook remains mild into next week lots of rain icons there so pretty changeable picture on the way but mild back to you Thomas thank you and that's it from us tonight from the 10 team it's good night bye bye